Um, so welcome to our deep dive in, in DAL plans and voice routing session. So it's actually the, oh, got it correctly. Um, the uh, B401, Link Server 2013 DAL plan and voice routing deep dive, uh, which actually means that this is a level 400 session, uh, one of the few. Um, so <clears throat> we're going to run through these objectives and takeaways. So we, we, we're going to talk about the voice routing dial plans within links, some of the new features within links. Um, we, we know this can be complex, so we, we'd like to take a deep dive in some of these more complex elements. Um, and some of the improvements we've made in the February update in 2013. Um, one small disclaimer, although we will go through the entire process, the, we will speed up going through certain basics. Um, so if there are any questions about that, please catch us afterwards. Um, we've got quite a lot to go through, so we'll probably talk a bit fast and go through it uh, rather quickly. Uh, if something goes too quickly, once again, please catch us after the session and we'll be more than happy to take you through that. Um, <clears throat> so, for those that have not been to any of my sessions yet, I'm uh, Cornel Bonnens. I'm a UC Voice Architect, work in the Communication Center of Excellence within Microsoft. I'm an MCM uh, Certified Master in Link 2010, Certified Solution Master in 2013. My SIP address and email address is on the board. Uh, I took a nice picture from Disneyland. I've been there. It's the only picture that actually made me look recognizable. Uh, and the, the little corner I had left, I put in some Star Wars Lego since I collect those. Um, and, and that's me, I guess. And I'll hand it over to my Austrian colleague. Thank you. So my name is Thomas Binder. I will be hosting the session together with Cornel. Um, very much is very similar. I work in the same team as Cornel. I'm also an um, Microsoft Certified Master, Microsoft Certified Solution Master. The differences are I do have a different email and SIP address. That's tbinder at microsoft.com. I live in a different city. I live in Austria and in Vienna. I was also in Disneyland, but I did not take a picture there. So this picture shows me playing field hockey. Um, yeah, if you want to contact me after the session, we will hang around. And this is, as said, my email and SIP address. So what will you be hearing in the next one hour and 15 minutes? We will talk about all the link voice routing. So you have a user, the user has link, uses enterprise voice enabled, starts typing a number. How does this number go to the PSTN? So we will talk about the format of numbers, E164. We will talk about the dial plans. What is a dial plan? What does the user do with it? Voice policies. How can we apply permissions to users to get sure that they can dial only certain numbers? Um, usages and routes, how can we get also sure that the call goes into the PSTN where we want to go it into the PSTN, and then the trunks, the connections directly to the PSTN. And then we will go a little bit deeper and look into scenarios. So you will see some uh, um, uh, log files there, you will see some letter diagrams, and we will show you how does CAC, call it mission control, and call routing look on a log level, what can you read there? Same for conferencing dial out, um, a little bit about gateway failure, session management, and then location-based routing. Let's start with the link voice routing. And I'll go here over to my PC, and I'll use this little virtual laser pointer that I have um, so that you can see where I'm actually pointing it. Um, this voice routing shows everything from a user entering a phone number to the call going to wherever it should go. We use the slidos in the Microsoft Certified Solution Master Training. We spent there about one hour, one and a half hours with it and go into really detail what happens at what step. Um, today, we won't spend as much time. Um, but still, from an overview, what's happening to a phone number, very important, so we will use the slide. So we start here in the upper right corner. A user wants to initiate a call. And basically, a user has different options to initiate a call. For example, Cornel could be in my company. He's also enabled for link. I have him in my contact list. I just double-click him and say, call this user. In this case, 
there are no phone numbers involved. I know his zip URI, so I can go directly and call him. So the zip URI, I take a shortcut, I go down here to the inbound routing. The inbound routing now knows, hey, this goes to a user who is in my link environment, and it just calls Cornel, and he might have multiple endpoints, they all ring. We, we, we will have a call established. However, I could also decide to call a phone number, type it in, that could be an external phone number. I could type it in um, with prefixes or without. Um, I could also dial an internal extension. For example, maybe Link was just introduced into my company, and I was used to call Cornel on his um, extension number, which was 1123. We want to enable users to still be able to do that, that they can just use these extensions and can still reach the user. But there needs to be some logic in Link so that Link knows how this number is connected to Cornel, and we walk through the process here. So let's say I enter this extension or phone number. So the first check that we are doing, is this an emergency call? If we have configured emergency calling um, with the location based uh, location information service based on the location, then we will skip a lot of steps because we know, well, 112, for example, it's an emergency number, goes directly to the emergency service. We don't need to do any normalization to that. We just apply our location policy, and then we will do the call. However, if it's not an emergency call, we look again at it. Is it a global number? So what's a global number? We consider global numbers um, E164 numbers. They are globally unique, unique identifiers, and they start with a plus. plus then um, country code, then area code, and then the phone number. So if this number that I typed in, and it's possible that I just typed in um, plus four three one one two three four five six would be an Austrian number in Vienna. If it's a global number, then we can go directly to the reverse number lookup and look, Do, does Link know this number? Is this number assigned to any Link user or Link object? Could also be a response group, could be auto attendant. Um, so we need to do this reverse number lookup. If I have a match again, Link knows now, hey, that's a link user or link object. So we do the match and we go back to the inbound routing. If this is not a global number, for example, I entered Cornel's extension 1123, then we do normalization. Um, the normalization rules, they are part of a dial plan. Each user has a dial plan assigned. And I might have a rule there that says 1123. It's actually a number that is plus 44737-1123 normalizes the number to this E164 number. Now it's global. After normalization, it goes to the reverse number lookup. Um, again, now it realizes, hey, that's actually Cornel. Inbound routing, it's an internal call. Obviously, we can assign different dial plans to different users because for use in a different country, they might use the same extension but want to call a different user because they want to call someone local in this country. So they need to have different normalization rules. They are part of the dial plan. Everyone can has, have his own dial plan. If it turns out that this number that we just entered is not known in our environment, well, that means it must be outside of our environment. And now we need to route it to the PSTN. Or it could be also legacy PBX that I have in my environment that is connected to Link. So maybe I need to connect it to this, um, forward the call to this um, PBX. Um, we will first check if this is in the range of our vacant numbers, if it's a call bug, orbit range. Um, if it is, then we will do some, play some announcement. Um, if not, then we check for the voice policies. The voice policies has PSTN usages, and we go into a little bit detail later on how they interact together. But this is basically the question, is this user even allowed to call the number? So I, I might be allowed to call all the local numbers in Vienna, but as soon as I want to do an international call, I might not be allowed to do that. You can control this with voice policies. So it says either four or three, no route found. That means, well, I as a user have obviously not the permission to do this call, or it finds the route and finds the correct route. With this route, it picks a specific gateway. The call is routed to the PSTN or the PBX. And the last part that happens is this box, are these boxes down here. And what we're basically doing here is 
we can still manipulate the number after we decided where to send it out. Why do we want to do that? Well, maybe I'm connected to a legacy PBX, and the legacy PBX does not want to have the number in an E164 format. So I can decide to manipulate both the dialed number, but also the call ID, and make, again, normalization rules. We use regular expressions for that, and say, well, let's just remove all the starting part and just forward a four-digit extension so that the PBX can handle that. So if you look at it from a high-level perspective, there are basically four things happening. The first thing, and this is what's highlighted at the moment, is really the user dials a number. What does Link need to do to get this to an E164 format, to a standardized format that we can handle? Next step, the red box, is the reverse number lookup. So we have the E164 number. We need to find out, is it inside the environment or is it outside? Then there's this gateway selection process, or maybe we don't select the gateway. So all of this is about permission. Is the user allowed to call this number? Will it be able for the user to call the number? And then finally, in the last step, we can do some changes to the called numbers depending on what our PSTN next hop is expecting, removing pluses, changing steering codes, all these kinds of stuff. And this is really the overview, again, of what's happening, what we just explained. So first, let's convert it to E164. Second, let's see if it's an internal number. Third, select the trunk where we need to send it out. And then finally, optionally, manipulate the number before we send it out. And why E164 is a good thing to do, um, Cornel will explain that. I hope so. So um, we, we, we've talked about these global numbers. And you saw this little box saying, check if it's a global number. And as Thomas said, E164 is our global number. So why do we like E164? For a very simple reason, E164 allows us to have a unique number globally. So whatever PBX, whatever phone I'm using, wherever I am in the world with my mobile phone, if I type in plus 3120500 my phone will ring. There's no exception to that. This will work everywhere in the world. No one else in the world will have this specific number. Um, if you look at extensions, if I go to a company and I dial 1,000, I'll get a different person in each company. It's, it's not unique. 1,000 is not a unique number. So since Link is designed to be a global operating uh, system, imagine having that 1,000 extension, but now you have to manage that in over 50 countries. How are you going to make sure that that one person that's today in Vienna and tomorrow in Madrid gets the guy he's expecting to get when dialing that number 1,000? So using dial plans, we can fix this, and we can transform those numbers into E164 numbers. And in the end, this leads up to E164 to be a globally unique number. That's why we'd like to use the dial plans to modify those. Um, this, this unique number can be put in Active Directory, which means it's now synced to your address book, it's synced to your, it's synced to your mobile phone. So that means as, that as I travel around the world, I can keep dialing that one single phone number wherever I am in the world. I can dial that one specific person wherever I am. Um, when you're federated with someone, you can share that number um, using your link federation. So once again, if I now dial that person and I don't want to do a VoIP call, that will work. If that person would share its internal extension with me, it would never work for me. Um, the biggest advantage we have when using E164, the reason why we absolutely love it, is if you're using this globally unique number and you're right today you're talking to a PBX, that's fine. So we use E164 within Link and we might need to use a trunk rule to modify the number when talking to the PBX, because PBX doesn't understand E164. Tomorrow, I've just bought this, this zip trunk, and I want to migrate all my numbers to a zip trunk. So my migration strategy is going to be modify my outbound route to now point to my zip trunk, which is going to be this one mouse click. And I'm not going to do anything else, and I've migrated. That's all I have to do. Because this number is my number, it's my unique number, and I'm just using a different ga gateway or a different zip trunk. 
So it eases your migration, it eases your integration, it eases your user experience. Um, we have a really good Next Hop article written by Doc Lawty and uh, Mr. Binder um, that you can find by going to that link. <clears throat> so let's, let's talk a little bit about those dial plans. So those dial plans are there to, to and let's, let's use the, um, let's use the uh, uh, um, politically incorrect term, fix users dialing, uh, dial behaviors. Because we've, we've established me dialing 1,000, that's not really um, a viable in a global solution. So what I'll do, I can assign a dial plan to a user, a pool or a site or a global one. In this case, this would be assigned to me. And we basically say whenever Cornel tries, Cornel tries to dial 1,000, let's transform that number into an E164 number. So I know he's dialing 1,000, but he actually means plus 3, 1, uh, uh, 20, 500, 1, 0, 0, 0. Um, and wherever in the world I am, if I now type in 1,000, it'll transform to this, to this E164 number, and it will get me the correct person. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, uh, uh, a dial plan would have multiple translation patterns using regular expressions. So we'll match something, that's, that's what you'll see in the pattern to match, and we'll create an E164 number out of that, which is our translation pattern. Uh, we provide you with a lot of uh, we provide you with a sort of a, um, a helper that you can use, like strip this many numbers of it, match this, match that. Uh, if you're really good at regular expressions, you can edit those and you can build your own regular expression to make it as complex as possible. Um, <clears throat> two points to, to note here. The more regular expressions you have in your dial plan, this is something processed by the client, so the more rules there are there, the more the client has to process. 10, 15, that's fine. But we're getting customers that are asking us, I have 2,000 rules in my dial plan. Will this work? Sure, it'll work. It'll just take 10 seconds for the number to be processed if it has to hit the bottom rule. So you have to be aware of that. Um, the second thing, the more complex the regular expression, the higher the CPU time. We've had people build very interesting, <laughs> complex regular expressions that could take up to a second to process because there were literally like six or 700 characters in there and all kinds of processing. So um, be aware of that. Um, <clears throat> one of the, the mystery portions we have in the product are external prefix. Um, what does it do? So <clears throat> in a dial plan, you can assign an external access prefix. So a lot of telephony systems like, well, Take a, phone, take a look at the phone in your hotel, you have to press a zero for an outside line. So that's your external access prefix. So what we can do is um, if you tell us, well, all our users are um, used to dollar zero or a nine or a six to get an outside line, and if they don't use that number, it'll always be an internal prefix, we can simulate that behavior quite easily. It's um, it's behavior that, that's unique to your company. I, I'm not pressing a nine before I dial a number on my mobile phone. I'm not doing it at home, specific to my company. And what we'd like to, to move into is a name dialing. So I just type in the name, just like I do on my mobile phone. Um, but I, we don't want to exclude users who have been using six, then the numbers for like 500 years. So, well, that's probably a long time, right? 500, let's say five. Uh, for people and for phones, it's a let's, long time. Let's go with five. I didn't want to see 500. Um, so what we can do is if you set up an external access prefix number, you can actually, in your rules, you can set up certain rules as being an internal number. So um, <clears throat> an internal extension. You can see the little checkbox there. So what happens if I set an external access prefix and I check certain number as an internal extension. This means in our logic processing, as soon as someone types in the number, we'll check, okay, so does this number start with the external access prefix? No, okay, then let's start processing the rules that have this little box checked first. If we've gone through all those rules and we haven't found a match, then we'll start processing the other rules we have. So you can use this to quite easily mimic traditional PBX behavior if you need to. <clears throat> so a little bit about routing and authorization, which was the second part of our routing 
uh, of our uh, voice processing mechanism that uh, Thomas showed us. So <coughs> we kind of have three things that you see within, within Link 2013 and the routes. Um, so basically, you have your voice policies. Voice policies are your authorization. They provide a set of services your users, your users can use, and they, provide, they contain the usages, you can see, that, um, that are available for that specific user, and the usages contain routes. So going from right to left, we'll have a route. That route has specific um, numbers to match. So that route says, if your number starts with a plus one, I'm your man, and you can use any gateway that's assigned to me. That route's linked to a usage, so one usage can contain one or more routes. And basically the usage says, well, uh, if this usage is assigned to your policy, or one or more routes, if this, this usage is assigned to your policy, check inside the usage which routes are there to allow for dialing of those numbers. So from left to right, our voice policy contains usages, a usage contains routes, and each route contains X numbers that you're allowed to dial. So usages are sort of the glue between our routes and policies. And they have a, um, there's a spe very specific reason for our usages. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the, um, uh, later on, especially when it goes to gateway failures and least cost routing. These, these become quite important. So, <clears throat> first, the voice policies. Would you like to take the voice I policies? I would like to, yeah, that's what we agreed on. So, oh. let, let me take I that. I was on a roll. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> so, Cornel just told us there are these three different concepts, and let's just look at the first one. We have voice policies. Um, voice policies, they can be either assigned to my global environment, so I could end up with one single voice policy that fits everyone. I could have site-specific voice policies, so let's say for my Austrian side, I do a different policy than I would do for my um, uh, Spain side. And then I can also go as granular as saying, for this specific user, I want to have this or that specific voice policy. And the voice policy does two things. Cornel spoke already about one of them. It is assigned to usages, or usages are assigned to it. They are glued together. And with the usage, I can enable users to have specific permissions. So if there's the usage, for example, to dial local numbers, I assign this to a voice policy. All users with this voice policy will be able to dial this, to use this usage. And most probably, I will have routes assigned to this usage that have all the local breakouts. And then I do the same for national, international, premium numbers. And I can create, based on that, different classes of services, whatever I want to provide to my users. The second part is that I have a lot of features. And you can see it here. It's a screenshot from the management tool. Um, call forwarding, delegation, call transfer, call park, um, simultaneous ringing, team call, PSDN reroute, the bandwidth policy override, where you can do an override for call admission control, a malicious call tracing. All of these are also part of the voice policy. So I can really here configure what is a user able to do. And that already should give you an idea that most probably, in the most situations, you will end up with user-specific voice policies. Um, we don't have really a recommendation where we say you should, you must have, or it's the best practice to have user-based policies. Um, what you should do is look into your requirements. Do you need to have different classes of users? So do you have your VIP users who are supposed to call everyone, every phone number, uh, um, and do all the features, and maybe you have just this um, uh, other information workers that should just call locally, then you will use um, user-based policies to configure that. Um, and as said, by assigning the PSTN usages, you give different classes of service. So you decide what can this user do. Um, it's not only about users. Think also about common area phones. If you have the common area phone, if you have your lobby phone, and it is a link phone, get sure that you configure it in a way um, it should be configured. So maybe you want to have it to be only able to dial internally to dial link users. Maybe you want to also enable local calls, but I'm pretty sure you don't want to enable long distance and um, premium calls. So get sure that you 
use these usages to prevent misusage and high cost. Um, something that we added new in Link 2013 is actually the ability to assign a second um, dial plan, uh, uh, voice policy. a second voice policy, thank you, second voice policy to users for the purpose of forwarding calls. So in Link 2010, if a user is able to call um, international numbers, then he can also forward all his calls to an international number. And there might be situations where you're okay with this user to occasionally call um, an international number, but you definitely don't want to have this user to forward all his calls to an international number because it might happen just much more often. If you want to, you can prevent that. So you can say here, have th three different settings. You can say using PSTN usages and specify a, a specific voice policy. You can say only forward to internal link users, or you can also um, say, well, just use what the user is allowed to do. So it's your choice. Um, one side note is that you might want to educate your users about that because they are not going to get any feedback. I, as a user, I can still enter the premium number, it's call forwarding number. Um, however, if someone then calls my phone number, call gets forwarded, it will just, well, not be forwarded, so the, the caller will get a busy signal, which might not be the best user experience, so get sure that your users know what kind of forwarding they're supposed to do and um, what will not work. PSTN usages. Um, so they are basically just a string. It's a word. There's not more into it. There's no configuration, but to this word you will attach the voice policies and you will attach the routes, and that will um, stick them together, assign them together. Um, you can use whatever names you want to, and we always recommend to put a little bit of thinking into that. Um, what do you want to do? And let's assume I have an international company. I'm present in Spain. I'm present in Austria. Um, now I can decide what does local re really mean for me. Um, I could decide I'm doing least cost routing anyway. So for everything that is going out in a local, to a local country where I have a presence, could be considered as local. So I could say, if someone dials a Spain number and someone else dials an Austrian number, both of them are local, no matter where the person is. However, maybe I really want to make this local by country. I want to get sure that this person in Austria can dial only Austrian numbers. Then probably I should create a usage that's, that's called um, local Austria national Austria, and so on. Um, usually we see these different classes that internal calls, um, if you have internal PBX that's connected to, then local, long distance, premium numbers, sometimes there's also national and international, depending on your needs. Most of the time you will create this after how much is this call going to cost me. If it's free, well then it's, it's local, and then if I have different cost classes, I, I will um, uh, create them. And then I create the routes, and I get sure that only the appropriate routes are attached to usage, and so I can create my um, permission set. Speaking about routes, route is again a regular expression that looks on a number, and if the number matches the regular expression, then this route can be chosen for the specific call, and the route is connected to a gateway. So basically, the route tells me, um, for this gateway, you can dial this number, or, well, if this number is dialed, you can use this gateway. And usually, if I want to have different classes of service, it means that per gateway I will have multiple routes. So, for example, I have my Austrian gateway, um, I configure a national usage. This national usage, I assign a route that has only national numbers for Austria. Then, if I have only an inter also an international usage, well, then I create a second route for all the international calls that would go out from Austria, and they include not only the Austrian numbers, but also international numbers. And this is how I can control that only specific routes are used in specific um, usages, and that only specific numbers can call in the specific um, usages. Now the question becomes, what happens if, I, if a user has multiple routes, if a route has multiple gateways? What's the preference? What can I choose to do? 
And I'll start with the first one, multiple trunks. Um, and when we speak about trunks here, it's basically very much the same if we speak about gateways, multiple trunks or gateways in the same root. So I create a root, but I put not one gateway in it, I put in three. Example would be in Vienna, I have 12 PRIs coming in to my environment. And for these 12 PRIs, I have three different gateways, so each of the gateways get four PRIs. From my perspective, they are the same. They are doing the exact same thing. There is no preference if the one or the other should be used. Actually, it would be quite nice if all of them would be used in a round-robin way. So what I would do in this case, I would put all these trunks, these gateways, in a single route, and then they will be selected randomly, one after the other. I can get sure that all of them will be used. So if you want to achieve that, put multiple trunks in the same route. Now, I could have multiple routes in the same usage. So I have my national usage and I have, for national, I have in the same country different um, gateways, different routes that, have all, that all match the national. Um, you need to be a little bit careful there. You can assign a, an order to these routes. However, we have seen that the order is not always applied. So most of the time it is, but there is some optimization happening in the, in the routing engine when it comes to um, um, regular expressions. So it might be that one route has very complex regular expressions, the other one has very simple ones, that always the simple one will be used. So this is no way to really um, create a preference. If you want to create a preference, what you would do is you would create multiple routes in different usages and give these different usages to a user. Um, usages will always be done one after the other, so I will start with my most preferred usage. If there is no trunk that I can use, if there is no route, then I will get to my next usage. And an example could be really, um, I want users to be able to call local numbers in Austria. Again, I have also a presence in Spain, and if the Austrian gateway for some reasons, if all of them break, I want the users to be able to go over Spain and call to Austria. Now suddenly I have a long distance call, so I really want this only to happen if the Austrian gateways are down. So in this case what I would do is, I would create a first usage and say National Austria. Um, if I dial an Austrian number on a happy day, everything is working, it just goes the out the Austrian gateway. However, then there would be a second usage, probably called something like local Austrian numbers fallback. And this actually uses the route in Spain. So now because I did not find any Austrian gateway that I can use, it goes to Spain, goes over to PSTN, back to Austria. Um, from cost perspective, not a local call anymore. But still, my users can do it. Using different permissions, I can enable it in a way that my very important users can dial if this happens, and the not so important users, well, they just can't. And Cornel will go into a little bit detail yes. examples. Here we go, pop quiz time. Um, so uh, we talked about the preference, so we're gonna check if we've all paid attention. So uh, this is my example, and I'll, I'll, I'll join you a little bit up here because this is more important than I am. Um, so we have this voice policy, a Seattle voice policy, has different usages assigned. You can see the order of the, of the voice policies, sorry, the usages, so we put our internal usage on top, then the local, then the Seattle national usage, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see each usage would have one or multiple routes. So our internal usage actually has multiple routes. And as you can see, they are non-overlapping. So um, if you look at the two, the local usage, we would have, um, once again, multiple non-overlapping routes. And that's a good thing, right? Because we can't control the route order inside the usage. We'd like them to be non-overlapping. The, if you look at the last resort usage, we'll have the routes where there's no, uh, where they have the same, <coughs> excuse me, regular expression, which means they're overlapping, which means that we don't have any real control over which route is taken. Uh, in the end, each route has one or more, more multiple gateways assigned, and as Tom has already explained, multiple gateways within a route means we're going to load balance those gateways. And I use a load balance in the uh, lightest sense of the word. So, pop quiz. I'm dialing plus one, two, oh, six, five, 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 one, two, one, two. Which gateway am I going to use? 
We can do this. Th this is the part where the yes. audience starts talking. You get to say something here. Gateway tree, there we go. So, are we correct? Oh, there we go, gateway tree. We're actually hitting our first usage, which had only one valid route assigned. We would, add, we would hit gateway tree. So let's say gateway tree is down. Which gateway would we use now? Once again. Yes, one or two. Uh, sorry, one or two, three or four. It's probably, uh, sorry, and three was down. Sorry. You see there, I got corrected. Um, you see, I, that's, and I prepared this so well. Um, yeah, you're right, so one, two or four. So probably we would use one or two because these are um, the same regular expressions. The routes were in order, for route four, eight, and 12 in our global route overview. So there's a 99% chance that gator one or two would be used. However, due to route optimization, it might be that gateway four would go before gateway five. Um, <clears throat> so let's go to the next one. So I'm dialing plus one, three, 12, six, 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 one, two, one, two. Which gateway would we use? Get to one or two. I, I don't think, oh, there we go, see? I just, yeah, that's why I've got an audience. They know exactly where to go, that's right. So one or two. Um, so the, the main points I'm trying to make here is gateways within a route will use either one of them. There's no way of controlling that. Using routes, we can sort of control that. We can use the global route overview, like Thomas explained, to order them. You can't order them with any usage. There's one route, for, one order for all routes in your global route overview. And depending on the regular expressions being used, this is sort of reliable. Don't use this if you need to be sure. You need to have multiple usages, as you can see on your left, to get this done, to get this, this sorting done. So the, um, as far as reusing, as you can see, my internal usage, that would be, re that would be re reusable throughout my company. Um, it points to a Seattle gateway, uh, to different gateways throughout my company. That's fine, I can use this one single internal usage through different, comp through, through different voice policies. Um, I might not want to use a local usage throughout different voice policies. I might want to have a specific local usage for Seattle, a specific local usage for Boston, specific lo local usage for different countries. You might hit countries where you're not allowed to use VoIP to call to. You need PSN rerouting. And we talk, we'll talk a little bit about that in local location-based routing. So <clears throat> we do offer you a lot of um, flexibility in routing this, a lot of options. However, um, this is one of the areas where we see the most mistakes being made. We expect something to go some way, and it doesn't, because we were relying on a route order, something like that. If you build your routes using your voice policy, use your usages for your order, and your routes to just control which numbers are being dialed, your route order authorization, you're good to go. <coughs> So, I'll take the trunks as well. See, I, I always, so we, we have this, we, we make a really good agreement, who's gonna take what, and I instantly forget when I'm here. I just wanna do more and more slides, so I, I rely on Thomas, because he. Well, you are in a role anyway. That's, that's right, I was in a role. So, um, trunks, so one of trunks is one of the new features we've introduced with Link 2013. Um, we used to have this gateway that you could, could assign to a, a mediation server and you could have this gateway in your routes. But then we had customers that wanted to do multiple gateways assigned to a mediation server, which is fine. You, you could easily do that. But then they wanted to other way around too. They wanted to have the same gateway being addressed by multiple mediation servers, which we couldn't really do unless you would do all kinds of DNS C names, um, which is, difficult if you want to do uh, 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 SSL encryption with SIP, um, a TLS encryption to the gateway, you would need to have all these names in your certificate and things were becoming difficult. So what we've done 
is we've added trunks, and trunks are now capable of managing this many-to-many -many relationships between gateways. So your gateway still has the same name, this one name, your mediation server has this one name, but each gateway can actually have multiple trunks, each mediation server can have multiple trunks, and you can assign multiple trunks to those different components. So a lot of the, the settings that we used to have on the gateway have now moved to our mediation server, uh, sorry, our trunk. And one of the things, most of the, the things that you would likely control is do we support refer? Do we require encryption for this specific gateway? And it might be that um, you, there's a regulatory requirement that um, requires you to do encryption between um, Seattle and the local gateway, but if London wants to use that gateway, encryption is forbidden. You, because we've moved this all to the trunk settings, you can now actually change this on a per mediation to gateway server relationship. Um, <clears throat> some of the features that were previously not exposed, they were controlled by a PowerShell, like RTP latching, forward call history, PS searched identity data. Those settings have now been exposed to the GUI if you would need them. Uh, and those are very PBX-specific features. Uh, your vendor would tell you if you need them. <clears throat> so one of the things, um, there was also a common request um, with the number translation. We always supported uh, translating the dialed number. So if I, I would be dialing plus three one, et cetera, et cetera. As soon as that number would go to a, to a gateway, maybe that's a PBX, doesn't understand E164, and it could change that plus three one to maybe a local number or zero zero three one, whatever it needs. Um, we've had that used a lot, but then we sort of hit this one little snack where we could do the dialing number, but then the dialed number, so who's actually calling, wasn't displayed properly because we wouldn't change that. So what we've added is now the ability to not just change the dialing number, so I'm dialing plus three one, whatever. We can, also, we can also change the dialed number. So who am I? What's the number from the person that's actually making the call? They use the same regular expressions. So um, in this example, if uh, Alice would be dialing plus four, four, two, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, based on this specific translation rule, uh, for the calling numbers, we would translate this into 0, 1, 1, and the rest of the number. Maybe the PBX only understands extensions as far as dial, uh, dialed numbers. We can use the cold number translation rule to translate that 443344 number, that's Alice's number, to the extension 5667. This is also the only place in Link where you can actually manipulate an E164 number. Because if we take a look back at the diagram that Thomas showed us in the beginning, if a number is global, we'll bypass all dial plans. This brings us to the scenarios. So in the scenarios, we'll take a little bit of a deeper dive into some of the functionality that we've been getting a lot of questions about, like call admission control. So how does call admission control, what does it do, and, and how can we log that? So what does it do? It prevents the network from oversubscription. That's the easiest explanation. Uh, in layman's terms, it blocks calls when stuff's busy. I, I can't make it any clearer than that. Um, so how do we do this? How do we log this? How do we know this is actually functioning? Um, some of the functionality that, we want to, that I'd like to show you, um, uh, reroute to internet, reroute to PSTN, block a call. So we, we do use alternatives. Reroute to internet is our preferred alternative we use. If reroute to internet is not possible, we'll try if we can do a PSTN reroute. You have to keep in mind the PSTN reroute will do a fallback to PSTN dialing, which means if I'm rerouting to using the PSTN to call Thomas, but I'm actually not allowed to dial any number in Austria, I won't be able to dial him. Because my voice policy will prevent, my voice usages will prevent me picking a gateway to dial him. So if you enable this and you expect PSTN reroute to work, make sure that your voice policies are equipped to handle the phone numbers of the people that you'd expect this to work to. If those block, 
if, if, those, if those don't work, so I can do instant reroute, can do PSTN reroute, I can always block the call. Um, that might be considered a bad user experience. In the end, if I've got 20 people where I can guarantee to have a crisp and clear call, and I have this one or two persons that get a message, the network's busy, you can't complete the call right now, that's in the end a better user experience than now having 22 people get a bad experience using VoIP. Um, one of the things that, that's, that's sometimes overlooking, overlooked, and we've called this to check both legs of mediation server, it's not just used for link internally. What you could also use if you'd had a SIP trunk with a limited capacity, link wouldn't know that capacity. So usually when you buy a SIP trunk, the capacity is not limited on the carrier side. What they'll tell you is, we'll give you a guaranteed bandwidth for 50 calls. But as soon as you make that 51st call, you can still make the call, and they'll charge you extra for that, but now you're impacting all the calls. So what you can do is actually enable call admission control on the secondary lag of the mediation server. So your uh, mediation server to SIP trunk lag to make sure there are no more than 50 calls at any given time. Um, <clears throat> implication here, if your fallback, and that, that's an important thing, and we'll look at that, if you use a fallback route, be aware that that won't use least cost routing, right? Because that link was busy. So let's take a little, let's take a look at some of those logs. So these were made with the new Snooper tool. Uh, go to download.microsoft.com, get the link 2013 resource kit tools, and you'll get the latest uh, Snooper tool. And it's actually to build, uh, capable of building those nice letter diagrams. So actually, the Snooper tool is not in the resource kit. It's the diagnostic tool. Oh, the, the diagnostic. And tools, it, it okay. comes with a lot of additional tools that you might like if you are used to use the. Um, the logging tool in Link 2010 where you could just log on a server that's not there in Link 2013 anymore. Unless you install the diagnostic tools, then you can still use that. So, diagnostic tools. Um, so what you'll see on the left, you'll see, the, um, uh, you'll see Alice trying to make a call. Um, so Alice on the left, trying to invite, trying session progress, progress report. You'll see the invite going uh, from the front end, because that, that's where we're located right now, uh, inviting the secondary user on the right. And you can see the difference in subnet. It's the 172.16.10 uh, versus the 172.16.20, two different network sites. So I'm inviting Bob in the secondary network site. He's sending me a trying ringing. Now Bob's done his policy check, and he knows, well, no bandwidth. So I'm going to ba send back a 488 not acceptable here. And I'm going to acknowledge that. We, we won't do any early media, won't do anything, because there's no room for, for actual making a call. So how does this look? This will look in your SIP logging, uh, in your Snooper tool, as a 488 not acceptable here. And we'll actually see insufficient, insufficient bandwidth to establish session, attempt PSTN reroute. And we'll, we'll always do that. We'll always see if we can do a reroute for this particular call. Um, this is one of the nice things about SIP. Uh, for those who aren't completely familiar with SIP, SIP was developed by the people that, uh, that, that, were, that knew a lot about computers, HTML. So SIP is a very uh, talkative uh, uh, signaling protocol. So it's very explicit in why stuff doesn't work. That's why the logging is usually pretty helpful, because it says, OK, 48 not acceptable. Sure, what does it mean? It actually means we've done this because there was insufficient bandwidth to establish a session. So it'll help you when doing your diagnostics. So in this case, we've, we've done this. OK, we have to do a PSTN reroute. OK. And we've, we have to terminate the early dialogue. We have to make sure that before we, uh, we're capable of sending out a 200 OK, before anything's happening, we have to tell them, whatever you're doing, stop it. It's not going to happen this way. We need to retry. We need to restart. So <clears throat> the client now knows, well, let's start again. So now <clears throat> we'll do a new call setup. And our outbound routing engine that you can see uh, on the left will do a new call. So we'll do a uh, call to the specific number that we've gotten from the tell URI. So we won't use the Active Directory numbers. We'll use the tell URI. So for instance, we were dialing uh, Bob. Bob had a tell, excuse me, a tell URI of plus 61755 assigned. We'll use that specific tell URI. And we'll add a little ms-skip-rnl. 
we don't want, because we want to skip reverse number lookup. We, we, we did reverse number lookup that turned this into a void call and there's insufficient bandwidth for the void call. So let's retry this and make sure we don't do that anymore. So we set up this call um, and we actually use a UC policy and we'll start dialing that specific, um, uh, we'll start, we start, we, let's retry that sentence. We'll match a usage policy within the voice policy for that specific user and we'll match a route and start dialing that number. So <clears throat> we've, in this particular case, on the right, we'll send a 503 service unavailable from pool B. Why, but what's happening here? We're trying to make a call. Why do we send a 503 service available from this secondary pool? Anyone dare to make a guess? We're trying to route a call through the secondary pool. It doesn't like us doing that. Take a wild stab at it. We're all baffled by this. No, no. So in this case, what, what I'm actually doing, I'm now, I'm now trying to set up a call using the secondary pool, which has a mediation server. But this secondary pool, it's, it's in the same subnet as Bobbin. So that's the, the, I, the plan was good. The thing is, no bandwidth, right? There was no bandwidth to that particular area. So I can try using a mediation server that's in the same subnet as Bob is, but, well, there's no bandwidth there. So the mediation server is going to do the same check as Bob did. He's going to see, well, there's no bandwidth to route a call to, to your mediation server. This is enabled because we enabled least cost routing. We'd like to use VoIP as far as we can. This was not possible. So we'll send back a 503 service unavailable. We'll now try our local pool. We had a fallback route in place. We'll try our local pool, and this actually works. You can see the 100 trying, then the 200 OK, and the setup of the call. So <clears throat> looking at the 503 service unavailable, this is actually, once again, our diagnostics ID tell us there's insufficient bandwidth to establish this session. This will let the outbound routing engine know, well, I, I know you want to do least cost routing. It's not possible. There's an insufficient bandwidth. So it, it's, it's not like, well, we can do a VoIP call to Bob. Let's cheat by doing least cost routing to that pool. Now, it, call emission control is, does everything. It, it looks at all the link endpoints, including mediation servers and audio video MCUs. Um, <clears throat> could we have known that in advance? Could we sort of skip this? Maybe. Um, we will try every gateway. We will try. We'll follow the, the usages. We'll follow the routes like we've defined. And if there's no gate, no bandwidth available, we'll respect that. And you can see that's in the outbound routing. And outbound routing knows, well, 503 insufficient bandwidth. Right. Let's try the next gateway. Let's try the next mediation server. And let's see if we can establish a, a call this way. Which brings us to conference dialout. I know Thomas wants to take over here. Yes, thank you, Cornel. So I'll be talking to conference dialout. Well, m maybe let's take a short pause. Any questions so far? If there's any questions, let's, there is a question. Fantastic. Can you use the diagnostic tools with Link 2010? So it's actually a collection of tools. For example, the Snooper tool, which the new features that um, we used here to create these letter diagrams, yes, you can use that with the old uh, logs as well. Some of the other tools are specific to Link 2013. And to be honest, I'm, I'm not sure if I know all of the tools. So you need to look into that and, and, and just find out. OK, and there is a follow-up question. Yes. So the question is, we, we already spoke about the normalization that we, that we do on the trunk when we send the, the number um, to the next PSTN hop, so we can do manipulation there of the calling number and called number. Um, and the question is, can we do this as well with an inbound call? And the answer is, yes, you can do it, but there is a limitation. The way to do it is that you assign a pool play pool-based dial plan to a gateway. This is something that you can do. You assign it to the gateway, and all the numbers coming in will be normalized. However, if the number is already starting with the leading plus, 
it will not be normalized because link will be assuming this is already a global number, so we don't touch it. So we have seen some customers with um, weird PBXs or PSTN providers who sent non-E164 numbers with a leading plus. If this is the case, then you have no option in link to fix that. What you could do is if you have a gateway in front, use the gateway, just strip the plus, and then do whatever complex manipulation you want to do within link, or you need to tell your provider to send a proper phone format. Now, conference dial out. Um, so as you know, if you go into a conference, users can dial out to the phone number. But what happens if the user is not enabled for enterprise voice? And if we look first at Link 2010, how Link 2010 handled that, um, what the case was is that if an anonymous user, someone from a different company, you invite to a meeting, if the anonymous user is in the meeting and you, the, meet, uh, the user wants to dial out, we would just use the voice policy of the conference organizer, and that would be used to dial out. So is the, if the, um, uh, the conference organizer, if, it, if he is allowed to dial a specific number, so would be all the anonymous users. So for anonymous users, great. However, for users of your environment who are enabled for link, but are not enabled for enterprise voice, they would not be able to do any dial out, which, well, is not a really good experience. In Link 2013, we have in our meeting policies this checkbox called allow participants not enabled for enterprise voice to dial out. So this is doing exactly that. So all users um, who are in a conference not enabled for enterprise voice can just dial out using the voice policy of the user who organized the conference. In Link 2010, there was a workaround. You could create static routes, but it was not really a good experience from an administration point of view. It did not give you a lot of um, possibilities to manage that, and now we can just use these existing enterprise voice policies. Is there a question? Yes, are there any licensing implications? Are there any licensing implications to do that? And it's great that you bring that up. So in Link 2010, if you would just enable users for enterprise voice to do dial out, then yes, they would need a license for enterprise voice because now they are enterprise voice users. In Link 2013, if the user is not enabled for enterprise voice, uses just a dial out, you don't need to have an enterprise voice license called the plus license. So the, the, be the, the one thing that I would want to add is, um, so conferencing in general, is covered in the enterprise cal. So if you add dial in and dial out to your conferences, you wouldn't need the plus cal for that. Um, and this is, and, and Thomas and me, we're not licensing specialists. So I, we, we can guide you and that's, that's it. You can take this for gospel. Um, if the, well, you can take Thomas for gospel. Anyway, the, um, if you're using this, um, this is all within reason. So if you if you have like this one user that schedules all conferences, so you now only have to buy one conference if an enterprise scale, it doesn't really work that way. Um, that that's uh, uh, there are some restrictions there, but in general, if you have this group of 50 people in your users that do all the conference, and you have a few users that sometimes join a conference, they would not need to be enabled. They would not have to have a plus scale to get a dial out to their station. They would be covered under the organ organizer's enterprise scale. Um, how, how does this look like from a log perspective? And um, if you look at the log, this is again the SIP log, then you would see the following. Um, here, this is the outbound call, so the outbound calling is actually what we logged for. Um, we can see here the organizer is as at contoso.com. We have the participant tk at contoso.com, and tk wants to do the dial out. And you can see down in the log here, non-enterprise voice enabled user, user dial out allowed. So apparently we mark this checkbox and we will use organizer's policy. There we say applying from your eyes outbound policy, and then we can see um, the caller ID that's actually from as at contoso.com that will be used. Um, one side note that might be interesting is in conferencing dial out, we are not doing any normalization, so users have to enter an E164 numbers if they want to be dialed out too. 
Um, what is if the user is a non-enterprise voice-enabled user? He organizes um, the, 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 the meeting. So now we see here TK at Contoso.com is the non-enterprise voice-enabled user. There is another user, RW at Contoso.com, who wants to dial out from this conference, also not enterprise voice-enabled. In this case, we are saying, well, they have this default policy, but there is no phone usage found for the user, so we give back a 403, not possible in this case, so it will not be possible to um, dial out. How can you solve that? You can actually assign voice policies to your non-enterprise voice-enabled organizers. Um, if you have a global or a site-specific voice policy, it will be applied because the user is in your global environment or in this, in, in this site. Or you can use PowerShell um, with a specific command to apply a specific voice policy to the user. However, remember, it's always the organizer's policy that will be applied. So if you apply this for one user, now, he can dial, now it can be dialed out in all of his, his conferences. This specific user, still not enabled for enterprise voice, joins another conference from a user not enabled for enterprise voice, but has no voice policy, then the user won't be able to dial out. So it's always think about the organizer. Organizer decides, can the organizer, um, uh, does it, the organizer allow the dial out? Gateway failures. Um, we don't want to go into all the detail here, just a few highlights, what we improved in Link 2013. Um, one thing that we actually did already in Link 2010 in one of the cumulative updates, we use SIP options to test if a gateway is online or offline. So every minute we send a SIP options um, request to the gateway and we expect a positive answer. If we don't get an answer five times in a row, then we mark this gateway as down. So if a gateway is down, if you don't do any calls, you wait five minutes, it will be marked down by the mediation server. Mediation server will know that it's not available. However, it could also happen that gateway was just up, responded to SIP options, and now it's down. Five minutes did not pass. Now you want to establish a call, send it to the gateway. Does anyone know how long that would take in Link 2010 until the mediation server declares the gateway for not available? It would actually wait for the TCP timeout about two times. So you should have about 40 seconds that needs to pass until the mediation server realizes that this gateway is down. Very bad experience for the user because you dial the number and, well, maybe I'll wait 10 seconds until my call is established, until I, go, I get the, the, the ring back, but I will probably not wait 40 seconds. So there are some improvements. Um, we do sort shorter TCP socket timers, so we send this invite. If we don't get anything back within four seconds, and it says five seconds at the top because it took us some time in the log until it came back to the user, uh, to, to the inbound, to the outbound routing. So if we don't get anything back within four seconds, we're saying, well, cannot connect to the gateway, send back a 504, um, send this to the, to the, to the pool, to the routing logic and say, well, we cannot call this call, we cannot route this call, and we will use a different gateway to do that. And if you really look off at what the mediation server is doing and how the mediation server sees the world, we talked about a mediation server can be connected to multiple gateways. So can, I can have three gateways um, serviced by one single mediation server. However, new in Link 2013, um, Cornel talked about that. We can also have a single gateway connected with multiple mediation servers. So if there's a connection wrong between a mediation server and the gateway, we don't really know what part it is. It could be the gateway. It could be the mediation server. So what we're doing here, if the mediation server is connected to multiple gateways and the mediation server cannot reach any of the gateways, it will tell the outbound uh, routing logic, well, Maybe the problem is me. Please try a different mediation server. Maybe all these gateways that I'm connected to, maybe they are still working and a different mediation server can reach them. I just can't. If the mediation server can at least 
reach at least one gateway. So again, we have three. We can't reach two, but we can still reach one. Then the mediation server will just assume, well, these two gateways are not working. We'll mark them as down, but we'll still use the third gateway. Um, and this is how it looks like in the logs. So on the left side, this mediation server cannot reach any of the three gateways it's it is connected to. So it will tell, um, it will give back the 503 service unavailable, and then there is this um, header MS enable DNS failover. Yes, so it tells the outbound logic, please just use another mediation server because I don't have anything available at the moment. Um, as opposed to that, if other gateways are reachable, it just tells the um, outbound lo logic, well, this specific gateway that you just decided to use is not available, please pick a different one. And that might go to the same mediation server or to a different one. And with that, I really would like to hear something about session management. I know, I'm going to talk about that. And I would like to answer a question first. Mm -hmm. uh, the so the, the question is, um, I have the case that my gateway is offline, offline, mediation server does the, the zip options, doesn't reach the gateway because it's offline, marks it as offline, everything is as expected, and then the gateway eventually comes back. So how does the mediation server know um, that the gateway is back again? Well, the, the mediation server will send the zip options again, and if it gets the, the response that it, it expects, then it will take the... Um, the question is now the time. Do you know I, the timing? I believe it's between uh, five and ten minutes. So, ten minutes later. yeah, we, we periodically check for the gateway to be back online. I believe it's five minutes, but that's. I have to look it up. Do we have a second question up there? S so the question is, um, the DNS. Fail over. Does this mean that we have a pool of mediation servers? Exactly, that's what's happening. No, so it's I. Behind the load balancer. Oh, sorry, it's behind the load balancer. Y yes, still. N no, I'm gonna say no. So if it's if so, it's Cornel is going to answer this question. Yes. So 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 if you I'm going to and, disappear. And that's now. why we we um, do not recommend placing mediation servers behind a load balancer. You cannot use DNS load balancing. So if you have multiple mediation servers be behind a hard load balancer, so from a link perspective, there's no reason to do so. You might have them from a gateway perspective because your gateway can't handle multiple mediation servers. This would not impact it from a link side. If you would place the hard load balancer between link and the mediation server pool uh, and publish them as one mediation server, then yeah, it's, it's going to be broken. We can only forward to another DNS name. So no other DNS name, it's nothing to do. So seven minutes left, session management. We might run a bit late, but this is interesting, cool stuff, right? So we're going to stay a little. You heard the other guys already stopped. You heard the clapping. We're going to go late. It's a level 400 session. That's always a good sign if you run late. Session management. So what, what session management? It's inter-trunk routing. So this was not available in Link 2010. A lot of people wanted to do this. It's not really there in Link 2013 unless you enable it. It's, it's so fun when, when uh, people help you building decks. Um, so uh, we've actually enabled the option so you can assign usages direct to trunks. So what does this do? If I get a call in from the trunk and it doesn't match any of my rules within Link, it doesn't do the reverse number look, it doesn't match anything in the, in the number lookup within Link, we do a fallback to the usages directly assigned to the trunk, and we'll try to reroute the call. So uh, what you can see here, I've got a qualified IPPBX, two link mediation servers, or this can be a pool or the same, um, within a link pool, and I've got a qualified gateway on the right. So what could happen is, on my inbound trunk, get a call in. This call doesn't match any of the numbers within link. It does match one of the PSTN usages, 
that usage actually says, well, these numbers go over the qualified gateway. That means that the PBX sends its signaling to the mediation server. The mediation server now knows, oh, wait, it has to go to a secondary gateway, sends the signaling to the secondary mediation server, connects it to the gateway, and we do support media bypass. So we have your medias in, in green here going directly between the IP PBX and the qualified gateway. If for some reason media bypass is not supported and is disabled on the trunk, we'll have the media running through the mediation servers. Um, <clears throat> so how do you actually assign this? So we, we can assign, as you can see, we have a trunk. Uh, you see, I keep pointing at the screen. Um, so we have a trunk assigned to the left. Uh, we have a trunk, a PSTN gateway, and we assign specific PSTN, uh, we assign a specific PSTN usage in this way, in this thing called internal extensions. You can see the call coming in on the example on the bottom left. And you're going to see, well, I tried to find this number. This number doesn't exist within Link. Let's apply into trunk routing. I've selected my usage internal extension, and I'll reroute this call. And you can see from the PBX on the left, there's an invite coming in to my local front-end and mediation server. You can see, well, I do a new re-invite to my secondary um, mediation server because that's where the gateway is connected to. So we now support this into trunk routing, which brings us to the last um, uh, uh, piece of this puzzle that we've also added in February 2013 update. It's location-based routing. It's a feature we've included for uh, some reg to meet regulatory requirements in certain countries. So for certain countries, you're not allowed to make a VoIP call um, from that country to a gateway in a different country. They need to traverse the local PSTN uh, gateways. So what we've done is uh, that we can apply a route based on the location of the caller. So if my caller is applied, if, if I have a voice policy that um, forces me to use location-based routing, when I go to a network site, I leverage the link network site. If I go to a site that has this location-based routing assigned, and we actually have assigned to the site, if someone's in this site and has location-based routing assigned, he's only allowed to use this set of usages. So if my voice policy tells me I can use either one of those usages, that's fine. If my voice policy says, well, your preference is to go through Boston, but I'm now in Delhi, I will not be able to make that call. The thing to note here is this works for both um, inbound as well as outbound calls. Um, I think I have, a, I have a slide here. So this, this works for both inbound and outbound routes. Also, um, this works for uh, any form of simultaneous ring or boss admin scenarios. So there's no way to cheat this scenario. So how to configure this? We use the... Uh, Existing link network sites, you create a voice routing policy. It's a special policy. It actually, you assign usages to this voice routing policy and you assign them to the site. And basically, you're now saying if someone's in this site, they're only allowed to use these specific usages. At that point, you can, you, the trunks used in those routes, you can tell them, well, um, uh, uh, you configure them to, that they are to be used in location based routing. Um, and the, the, the next step you take is you enable your voice policies assigned to those specific users or maybe your global users to use and leverage this location-based routing and you um, finish with enabling location-based routing for your entire company. So you can have a group of users controlled through the voice policy that actually uses location-based routing and you have this subset of users that are actually not allowed to use location-based routing which means they can do whatever they like and you're hoping that they never travel to India. Um, I think that's the, that, there we go. So how to create those voice routing policy. And it's, it's tempting to see that this is a voice policy. It's really something different. And I, I, I would have hoped we, we had named this differently because this will cause confusion. It's specific voice routing policy. This is the one you're using to apply to your site. Um, and still, just because I'm in a site that has a usage policy that allows me to dial uh, service numbers 
if my original voice policy doesn't allow me to dial those numbers, I will honor those usages. I will honor that policy. So the voice routing policy only tells me, gee, if you have these usages inside your existing voice policy, you can use them when you're traveling here. That's the only thing we're doing. We're not adding extra authorization. We're not allowing you to do extra stuff. We're basically telling you from all the stuff you thought you were allowed to do, this is what you're actually allowed to do when you're traveling here. <coughs> so how does this work? Um, as soon as we start making this, this uh, route, outbound routing will actually sell, well, uh, Amy Strand, as.composer.com, wants to um, do a outbound call. We can actually see, well, which, which voice routes are we allowed to use in this case? Um, uh, we're allowed to use internal extensions. We'll tell them, well, there's one route available for this target. We'll authorize the call, and we can use the usages from that specific site. So we, we honor both the voice policy and the site policies. And since the lady helping us has not started screaming yet, we can just continue. Um, so L let's, let's maybe stop it here. So let's do the session wrap up. Okay. So w what we spoke about in this session is um, really w w we should now understand what is happening when the user enters the phone number, how does it enters a number, how does it become a phone number, how is it routed to an internal user, how does it go to the PSTN or, or PBX. So we know how gateways are selected, we know how they are authorized, what the usages are doing, and have now really a good understanding how we should create our voice plans, style plans, um, um, in, in order to enable users to what they should do. We also looked into these um, features, what the logs look like. So what do we see? How is the mediation server behaving? What does CAC mean? And finally, Cornel showed us what the February update with location-based routing can do for us and how we can now deploy link in countries that have such legal requirements. Um, there's some related content, there are some great resources, but I really want to remind you to do your evaluations because that helps us a lot. And with that, I want to thank you, and we will be available for questions if you have any. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>